Here's the key for quiz 11. Uh, the first question says, draw a reasonable arrow pushing mechanism for this reaction. Uh, I would like to point out that um, in recent years, I've started to ask students to fill in the product as well. So you should be able to predict the product and draw the mechanism of similar reactions. Uh, we can observe that we've got a ketone, we've got alcohol, we're making an acetal functional group here, and we're losing water. And we have some acid catalyst. It's probably better to write sulfuric acid as a catalyst here because of course H3O plus implies there's some water present as well and if we're making water Le Chatelier's principle tells us that that's not going to help us drive the reaction to completion. So the first step in any reaction that involves sulfuric acid catalyst is a proton transfer where we protonate the ketone now it is a better nucleus or um, electrophile and I'm going to attack with my nucleophile ethanol. And now I have my extra hydrogen here. I need to do a couple proton transfers to eventually lose water. I'm going to use ethanol as my weak base to do that proton transfer. There's my protonated ethanol. I grab the hydrogen and put it onto the uh, hydroxyl group. And all of these reactions are um, definitely uh, reversible. I don't always draw those arrows properly, but you can put in reversible arrows for every one of these steps here. And now I can push water off using the lone pair on my uh, ethoxy group. So that's loss of leaving group. All the rest of these have been proton transfers. So what do we have now? I have that species, which looks like we just uh, put an ethyl group onto our ketone. And I've produced water. We told you that that was one of the byproducts. And I still have lots of ethanol remaining. I'm going to need extra ethanol now to get to my acetal. And we are now just one step removed from the acetal. I uh, just have to do a proton transfer step. And I'm going to use another ethanol here. And that's all there is to it. So there's a proton transfer, nucleophilic attack, proton transfer, proton transfer, loss of leaving group, nucleophilic attack, and a proton transfer. This is the acetal formation mechanism. Question number two, draw the expected products for this reaction here. This is an imine. We have acid and water present. Uh, and so basically we're going to hydrolyze the imine, forming a carbonyl in place of the imine, so at this carbon, and forming, in this case, a, an amine. Uh, and the amine will have one R group on it, the ethyl group. So this is an imine hydrolysis. You should be able to draw this mechanism too. Uh, it is in your textbook, and it is very similar to the one we just drew on question one, except in this case, we're going backwards. We're adding water to our um, carbonyl derivative functional group uh, to reform the carbonyl and form the, uh, the amine in this case. Quiz number 12, uh, well, let's look, we're asked to do a synthesis of both of these molecules. So let's take a look at, uh, I'm going to do the second one first. Uh, we have five carbons here, and I have five carbons to get to the functional group, and then I've added these three, and I've added these three along with an, a, a nitrogen. And so as we just saw in the previous question, most likely this is the last step. If you want to use catalytic acid here, that's fine. We showed you in lab that that is not necessary. Um, but now the question becomes, how do I get from this five carbon species to this uh, eight carbon species? I need to install a carbonyl at this position, and I need to add a three carbon group. Um, I can add three carbon groups via Grignards, and when the Grignard produces a secondary alcohol, I can oxidize that secondary alcohol with PCC to form the desired 
ketone. Let's try to draw this a little better. So if I can make this via a Grignard, I can oxidize it via PCC. And I can make that via a Grignard with that three carbon Grignard and this aldehyde. Of course, that's the first step. Second step is just mild acid workup. How do I get to this aldehyde from this uh, five carbon alkene? Well, it's just a matter of putting an OH group here and then oxidizing it. And that, of course, is BH3 THF followed by peroxide and base. That gives us the OH in the desired position. PCC will allow us to form the aldehyde. Uh, the aldehyde reacts with the three carbon Grignard to make the secondary alcohol, reoxidize that to the ketone, uh, and attack that with the amine to get to the, uh, the amine to get to the imine product. Okay. Here we have an ester when we start with styrene. And this is very interesting. It has the same number of carbons, except that we uh, now have an oxygen between the carbon groups. So I think there's a couple ways we can get here. Um, one way to make esters is the bayer villiger reaction. So maybe that's one way to get here. Remember that phenyls are good at migrating. So if I have that species, I can add an oxygen but in this, between this bond. We can cleave this bond and add an O. I make the product. How do I get to that uh, starting material? Well, I can oxidize the appropriate secondary alcohol. And I can get to the secondary alcohol from styrene just with H3O+. So acid and water will produce that alcohol for me. Here's quiz 13 and 14. We're asked to decide which side the equilibria will lie on. Um, and as we were told, it's good to know pKa values here. So the pKa value of alcohols are around 17. The pKa value of this doubly acidic hydrogen here is around 9. So let's write that down. And we know that the, um, the equilibrium will lie on the side of the weaker acid or the weaker base. Um, so the weaker acid is going to have the larger pKa. So in this case, the equilibrium will lie on the right side. Let's look at uh, the second one. We have acetone here. And in this case, the pKa of acetone is around uh, 17. Actually, 19, I believe. And so the pKa of alcohol, again, around 17. So we're going to look for the side with the weaker acid. And that's going to be, uh, in this case, the dimethyl ketone or acetone. It has a pKa of around 19. And so the left side is going to be favored at equilibrium. And this goes to show why we can't do very successful alkylations using ethoxide to deprotonate ketones because most of, most of our reagents will be in the unreacted state. And so if I were going to add an alkylating agent to this equilibrium, if I have most of my reagents on, in this state, this O- is going to get alkylated, not the carbon as we might desire. Uh, so we'll alkylate our ethoxide. Uh, the second one, again, has acetone, 19.2. And then we have this amine on the far right, and that's around 35. And so obviously this is a much weaker uh, acid than acetone. So this side is favored. In fact, because there's a difference of more than 10 pKa units, we can say that there's no equilibrium at all. Everything is on the right side in this third example. Okay, so we have uh, some predict the product questions. Um, this one is a peroxy acid. This is peroxyacetic acid followed by KOH. So the first thing we're going to do is cleave this bond and add an oxygen. So this is going to be the first intermediate here. We're going to make an ester. And then KOH, of course, is going to hydrolyze the ester. Uh, and so we're going to be left with an 
and since we're in basic conditions, we haven't acidified yet, we're actually going to get uh, phenoxide and the carboxylate anions present here because we're in strong basic conditions. After we add acid, we make some OH groups here. Um, the next question involves a ketone and an amide. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is react one of those with uh, ethylene glycol and acid. And again, this should probably be H2SO4 in brackets so that we're not adding any water. We don't want any competing nucleophiles. The first thing that we're going to do is react the ketone to form the acetal. Uh, and so that protects the ketone. And now we can do some chemistry with the amide that uh, won't react with the ketone. So SOCl2 will re uh, dehydrate the amide uh, and actually form a nitrile. So the intermediate that we're going to expect after step two, again, has the acetal. And this is uh, getting a little confusing here. I'm going to draw this bond kind of weird. So that's the intermediate we expect after step two. We've dehydrated the amide. We can react that with methyl magnesium bromide, and we're going to add a methyl group to that carbon. So adding a methyl group to that carbon leaves us with this state before we add uh, before we add um, the acid and water. The acid and water will not only deprotect the ketone, but it will protonate this imine, hydrolyze the imine, and form a new ketone right there. Uh, and so what we can do, we're going to draw this, I'm going to draw it up here using a different color. Nope, I don't have uh, don't have the protecting group anymore. This is just a ketone here and a ketone here. So the end result is that we've converted this amide into a methyl ketone. So this is one simple way of basically getting rid of the NH2 and installing any R group you want based on what you um, bring in using the Grignard reagent. So we can now convert amides to ketones fairly easily. This reaction down here, it appears that we're taking this ketone, turning it into an alkene. So I need a four carbon species that will add to the ketone. That's going to be a Wittig reagent. So one, two, three, four carbons. There's a negative charge right there, positive charge on the phosphorus. And that's all we need for that one. And the fourth reaction here appears to lose this methyl group and add an OH group. So this is uh, the haliform reaction. If we add excess base and excess bromine, followed by mild acid workup, we can do the haliform reaction of essentially losing CBr3- and forming the carboxylic acid product. All right, the third question on this quiz is a roadmap problem. We're just going to fill in uh, the blanks here. Uh, the first question involves turning an iodine into an OH. Um, we could probably use NaOH, uh, and that would be a very quick uh, SN2 style reaction. Uh, the second one reacts the hydroxide with chromic uh, or chromium trioxide, basically another form of the Jones reagent for oxidizing. Uh, and so what we're going to do, we're going to get the, the carboxylic acid. We're going to turn that carboxylic acid into the acid chloride using SOCl2. And we can react the acid chloride with an amine. And I'm going to use excess amine because one of the amines will be used to soak up the HCl that's formed. Uh, so we're going to form the amide using an acid chloride and an amine. We can reduce the carbonyl of this amide with LaAlH4, basically losing the carbonyl and keeping the uh, secondary amine. And then this is an acylating agent that can acylate primary and secondary amines. So I'm just going to add an acyl group to that. We did this reaction in lab where we acylated the amine we produced. Uh, and that's about that. Those are just some simple 
uh, carboxylic acid derivative uh, manipulations. Here is the second page of that quiz. We want to name these compounds here. First thing we want to do is identify, uh, this is an amide here, and it has an R group propyl. So we're going to call this N-propyl amide. Um, and then we want to number our carbons, starting with the carbonyl, to get the parent chain. That's going to be hex, hexane, and that becomes hex X amide. And we have a stereo center at carbon four, so I need to identify that. Let's use green to identify the priorities. Uh, the right side of the molecule will be highest priority. The ethyl group and the methyl group, and then of course the hydrogen. So this is R. So I need to identify this as R. I don't need a four because there's only one stereo center, so I can just put R right there. And then I can call this 4 methyl hexanamide, hexanamide, and N, N propyl. So let's write this. N-propyl 4-methyl hexanamide, and that is the name of that molecule. This uh, molecule on the bottom is a ketone, and it's got, uh, looks like, two stereocenters. So the chlorine is highest priority, then the ketone, then the methyl, so that's going to be S. And let's look at the methyl group. Uh, the carbonyl is highest priority, then the branched carbon, then the methyl. That is R. So what I have here is, I need to number my, number my uh, chain. I'm going to start at the side nearest the carbonyl. That's going to dictate the numbering scheme in this case. And so that's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So I have 2S, 4R, and I have... Uh, own, and I have two chloro. Chloro probably goes before methyl or ethyl, so I can go two chloro, then I have five ethyl, and four methyl, and where is the ketone? It's on the third one, so I'm going to call it three heptanone. You could call it heptan own if you wish. Uh, I prefer putting the three outside of the heptanone name. Okay, next qu question number five. Propose a reasonable synthesis of both of the following molecules. Here, there is a restriction. Uh, we can only use reagents that contribute six carbons or fewer in each step. Uh, so we can't just plunk on a, a uh, 18 carbon uh, piece if we want to uh, finish this up really quick. So what we need to identify here is that this is a four carbon alkene. There are four carbons here, so that's probably a good indication that uh, those four carbons came from our alkene. Uh, how do we add carbons to the end of an alkene? Well, if it were a carbonyl, we could add those carbons pretty easily. So what if it, what if we oxidized to the primary alcohol, third step, PCC, we should have this aldehyde, and we can add, uh, let's see, let's add this three carbon piece first, so I'm going to actually put it out here, aldehyde plus Grignard, we know makes a, um, a secondary alcohol. I can oxidize that secondary alcohol again to a ketone, and I can react phenyl Grignard with the ketone to add my second carbon group. Again, mild acid workup. And now we are 
there, right? We've made this tertiary site with three carbons attached to it. It's right there. I just need to eliminate the OH. So I need some strong acid. Basically, catalytic amount. Don't add any water. Uh, this is an E1 dehydration uh, with loss of water, and that will get me to the product. So this is basically just a, uh, a double sequence of adding Grignards and then reoxidizing uh, my resulting alcohol. Let's look at the second uh, molecule that we want to make. Uh, I'm going to do some numbering here. Obviously, there's a five-membered ring and then two more carbons. I think these are probably those two additional carbons there. And so we can see that carbon two has a lot of action happening on it. We need to make add a methyl group to carbon two and an isopropyl group to carbon two. Uh, and eventually, we need to have an alcohol form there. So most likely, we can add a Grignard to carbon two to end up with this product. So if I have this species, again, I have one, two. Those are my two carbons that I've identified. Uh, I can produce this from my starting material, perhaps. And if I do that, then my final step is just isopropyl Grignard uh, and mild acid workup. So how do I get here from my starting material? It looks like I need to add a methyl group to carbon two. I, um, I can add methyl groups and end up with a ketone if I uh, oxidize the Grignard addition product. And I can get to the Grignard addition product from the appropriate aldehyde. So if I can get to this aldehyde here, I can add a methyl group to the carbonyl carbon. Mild acid workup gets me to the secondary alcohol. I can then do two more steps to get to the product. So how do I get to the aldehyde? And again, let's make sure we're, we're keeping track of these two carbons. Basically, I need to turn carbon two into an aldehyde. I can do that via first step NaOH. Gives me a primary alcohol at that position, second step PCC will oxidize that primary alcohol to the aldehyde, and then I can add a Grignard. I can oxidize the resulting secondary alcohol uh, to a ketone and add a Grignard again to get to my final product. All right, here's some more synthesis practice for you. Um, here, we're allowed to contribute seven carbons or less per step. Uh, so that just is a little bit of a restriction uh, on what we can do. Uh, if we look at the first uh, molecule, this is an ethyl acetoacetate uh, molecule. So we know that we can do some alkylations at this position. We can lose CO2 and end up with basically an alkylated acetone. Do I see anything here that could have been an alkylated acetone? Well, this is an ether here. And this ether could have been produced from an alcohol in this position and alkylating that alcohol. And of course, that alcohol could have come from a carbonyl in this position. So maybe that is the acetone we're looking for. And then that means these two carbons would have been the methyl groups on the acetone. And we could have alkylated. Maybe we alkylated these two using our ethyl acetoacetate here. And maybe this one was added uh, in a different fashion or alkylated in a different uh, way. So let's look at this So there you can see if I have a ketone there, I can reduce it, and then I can alkylate it to make the methyl ether. Um, and I can get to this ketone. Let's see how many carbons I have here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, so I could add this whole piece, maybe. Um, since this is an alpha carbon, maybe I can add this via an aldol condensation, and then I can hydrogenate 
reduce the double bond that's formed here. Let's give that a shot. <clears throat> so the first thing I'm going to do is LDA at low temperatures and we're reacting it with this methyl ketone. The second thing would be to bring in a ketone with that shape uh, and I want to heat this so that I can affect the aldol condensation. And then third, H2 and palladium should reduce the double bond that is formed right here during the aldol condensation, reduce that to the single bond. And now I hope you can see that I basically have a doubly alkylated acetone molecule, which is what I can get to via this starting material. So if we install the CO2 group that's lost, right, so let's just identify this carbon as the carbon in the starting material. Right, so if I doubly alkylate that carbon and then I basically um, hydrolyze the ester and heat, I can remove the ester and the carbonyl. Again, the uh, red carbon is right there. Uh, and then H3O plus would be responsible for not only forming the carboxylic acid, but also losing CO2. So minus CO2 in this case, and we use heat to do that. So now you can see that I've just doubly alkylated that first carbon. So let's do that. Uh, we can do that in a long stepwise process. So we can alkylate first, and again we're going to start with our given starting material. So we, we put the three carbon chain on, uh, then we uh, deprotonate again, put the benzyl group on, and uh, the last step is actually this mild acid workup, which hydrolyzes the ester to the carboxylic acid allows decarboxylation to take place and leaves us with basically this substituted acetone. So this is a very lengthy process to make a, a pretty complex alkane here, uh, or an ether. Let's look at the second problem. We start with ethyl bromide, very boring, and we make this seemingly quite complex, uh, doubly unsaturated ketone. And we can make both of these bonds via aldol condensations. Uh, as long as we start with this five-membered ketone. So let's do that. Um, if we add base uh, and benzaldehyde and we heat this, this is all in one step, we can add the final um, seven carbon piece on this side. And we can do the same thing right before this to add the first seven carbon piece. So NaOH, benzaldehyde, and heat. And we're not too worried about self-condensations because this molecule is a ketone. It's going to be less electrophilic than the aldehyde. So if there's aldehyde present that has no alpha hydrogens, the NaOH can only deprotonate on one of these alpha positions. And then uh, it's much more likely for an anion here to react with the aldehyde than it is to react with another ketone. And so we can pretty much guarantee that this is the product we'll get, repeat that same sequence again, and do that again. So now the question becomes, how do I take ethyl bromide and turn it into uh, three pentanone? Well, I can actually do that via a short Grignard oxidation sequence. So I can turn this into a Grignard. I can react it with a three carbon aldehyde. Mild acid workup gets me to this species, and I'm sure, pretty sure that you can see how to quickly get to the ketone 
uh, really just PCC, so we can oxidize it quickly. So we take our two carbon starting material, turn it into a Grignard, react that with uh, propanal, three carbon aldehyde, making the uh, three pentanol. We can oxidize that to three pentanone, and that can do a double aldol condensation with the same reagents both times to add both of these phenyl groups with the, bo with the two different uh, alpha beta unsaturated positions. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, would be one, two, three, four, five step sequence to really greatly increase the complexity of our starting material.